June 26. Dear Varinka, The fact is that I really had not read that horrid book, my dear girl. It is true I looked through it and saw it was nonsense, just written to be funny, to make people laugh. Well, I thought it really is amusing. Maybe Varinka will like it, so I sent it you. Now, Ratasiev has promised to give me some real literature to read, so you will have some books, my darling. Ratasiev knows he's a connoisseur. He writes himself. Oh, how he writes! His pen is so bold, and he has a wonderful style. That is, there is no end to what there is in every word, in the most foolish, ordinary, vulgar words, such as I might say sometimes to Faldoni or Teresa. Even in such he has style. I go to his evenings. We smoke, and he reads to us. He reads five hours at a stretch, and we listen all the time. It's a perfect feast. Such charm, such flowers, simply flowers. You can gather a bouquet from each page. He is so affable, so kindly and friendly. Why, what am I beside him? What am I? Nothing. He is a man with a reputation, and what am I? I simply don't exist, yet he is cordial even to me. I am copying something for him. Only don't you imagine, Varinka, that there is something amiss in that, that he is friendly to me just because I am copying for him? Don't you believe tittle-tattle, my dear girl? Don't you believe worthless tittle-tattle? No, I am doing it of myself, of my own accord, for his pleasure. I understand refinement of manners, my love. He is a kind, very kind man, and an incomparable writer. Literature is a fine thing, Varinka, a very fine thing. I learnt that from them the day before yesterday. A profound thing, strengthening men's hearts, instructing them. There are all sorts of things written about that in their book, very well written. Literature is a picture, that is, in a certain sense, a picture and a mirror. It's the passions, the expression, the subtlest criticism, edifying instruction, and a document. I gathered all that from them. I tell you frankly, my darling, that one sits with them, one listens, one smokes a pipe like them too, if you please, and when they begin to discuss and dispute about all, all sorts of matters, then I simply sit dumb. Then, my dear soul, you and I can do nothing else but sit dumb. I am simply a blockhead, it seems. I am ashamed of myself so that I try all the evening how to put in half a word in the general conversation, but there, as ill luck would have it, I can't find that half word. And one is sorry for oneself, Varinka, that one is not this thing nor that thing, that, as the saying is, a man one is grown, but no mind of one's own. Why, what do I do in my free time now? I sleep like a fool. While instead of useless sleep, I might have been busy in useful occupation. I might have sat down and written something that would have been of use to oneself and pleasant to others. Why, my dearie, you should only see what they get for it. God forgive them. Take Ratasia, for instance. What he gets. What is it for him to write a chapter? Why, sometimes he writes five in a day, and he gets three hundred roubles a chapter. Some little anecdote, something curious. Five hundred. Take it or leave it. Give it or be damned. Or, another time, we'll put a thousand in our pocket. What do you say to that, Favar Alexeyevna? Why, he's got a little book of poems, such short poems. He's asking seven thousand, my dear. He's asking seven thousand. Think of it. Why, it's real estate. It's house property. He says that they will give him five thousand, but he won't take it. I reasoned with him. I said, take five thousand for them, sir, and don't mind them. Why, five thousand's money. No, said he. They'll give me seven, the swindlers. He's a cunning fellow, really. Well, my love, since we are talking of it, I will copy a passage from The Italian Passions for you. 
That's the name of his book. Here, read it, Varinka, and judge for yourself. Breaking in, what follows at this point is several excerpts from Ratazyev's stories interspersed with Makar's reactions. In a print text with the benefit of quotation marks, this passage is easy to parse. In audio format, we'll just have to do the best we can. End of comments. Vladimir shuddered, and his passion gurgled up furiously within him, and his blood boiled. Countess, he cried, Countess, do you know how awful is this passion, how boundless this madness? No, my dreams did not deceive me. I love, I love ecstatically, furiously, madly. Oh, your husband's blood would not quench the frantic, surging ecstasy of my soul. A trivial obstacle cannot check the all-destroying, hellish fire that harrows my exhausted breast. Oh, Zenaida, Zenaida! Vladimir, whispered the countess beside herself, leaning on his shoulder. Zenaida, cried the enraptured Smielski. His bosom exhaled a sigh. The fire flamed brightly on the altar of love and consumed the heart of the unhappy victims. Vladimir, the countess whispered, intoxicated. Her bosom heaved, her cheeks glowed crimson, her eyes glowed. A new, terrible union was accomplished. Half an hour later, the old count went into his wife's boudoir. Well, my love, should we not order the samovar for our welcome guest? He said, patting his wife on the cheek. Well, I ask you, my dear soul, what do you think of it after that? It's true, it's a little free, there's no disputing that. But still, it is fine. What is fine is fine. And now, if you will allow me, I will copy you another little bit from the novel Yermak and Zuleika. You must imagine, my precious, that the Cossack Yermak, the fierce and savage conqueror of Siberia, is in love with the daughter of Kuchum, the Tsar of Siberia, the Princess Zuleika, who has been taken captive by him. An episode straight from the times of Ivan the Terrible, as you see. Here is the conversation of Yermak and Zuleika. You love me, Zuleika. Oh, repeat it, repeat it. I love you, Yermak, whispered Zuleika. Heaven and earth, I thank you. I am happy. You have given me everything, everything for which my turbulent soul has striven from my boyhood's years. So it was to this thou hast led me, my guiding star. So it was for this thou hast led me here, beyond the belt of stone. I will show to all the world my Zuleika, and men the frantic monsters will not dare to blame me. Ah, if they could understand the secret sufferings of her tender soul, if they could see a whole poem in the tear of my Zuleika, oh, let me dry that tear with kisses, let me drink it up, that heavenly tear, unearthly one. Yermak, said Zuleika, the world is wicked, men are unjust. They will persecute us, they will condemn us, my swert, sweet Yermak. What is the poor maiden nurtured amid the snows of Siberia in her father's yurta to do in your cold, icy, soulless, selfish world? People will not understand me, my desired one, my beloved one. Then will the Cossack saber rise up hissing about them. And now what do you say to Yermak Varinka when he finds out that his Zuleika has been murdered? The blind old man, Kuchum, under cover of night, steals into Yermak's tent in his absence and slays Zuleika, intending to deal a mortal blow at Yermak, who has robbed him of his scepter and his crown. "'Sweet is it to me to rasp the iron against the stone,' shouted Yermak in a wild frenzy, wetting his knife of Damascus steel upon the magic stone. I'll have their blood, their blood. I will hack them, hack them, hack them to pieces. And after all that, Yermak, unable to survive his Zuleika, throws himself into the Irtish, and so it all ends. 
And this, for instance, a tiny fragment written in a jocose style, simply to make one laugh. Do you know Ivan Prokofievich Yellowponch? Why, the man who bit Prokofy Ivanovich's leg. Ivan Prokofievich is a man of hasty temper, but on the other hand of rare virtues. Prokofy Ivanovich, on the other hand, is extremely fond of a rare bit on toast. Why, when Pelagia Otonovna used to know him. Do you know Pelagia Otonovna, the woman who always wears her petticoat inside out? That's humor, you know, Varenka. Simply humor. He rocked with laughter when he read us that. He is a fellow, God forgive him. But though it's rather jocose and very playful, Varenka, dear, it is quite innocent, without the slightest trace of free thinking or liberal ideas. I must observe, my love, that Rataziev is a very well-behaved man, and so an excellent author, not like other authors. And, after all, an idea sometimes comes into one's head, you know. What if I were to write something? What would happen then? Suppose that, for instance, apropos of nothing, there came into the world a book with the title Poems by Maka Diovushkin. What would my little angel say then? How does that strike you? What do you think of it? And I can tell you, my darling, that as soon as my book came out, I certainly should not dare to show myself for the Nevsky prospect. Why, how should I feel when everyone would be saying, here comes the author and poet Diovushkin. There's Diovushkin himself, they would say. What should I do with my boots, then? They are, I may mention in passing, my dear girl, almost always covered with patches, and the souls, too, to tell the truth, sometimes break away in a very unseemly fashion. What should we do when everyone knew that the author Diovushkin had patches on his boots? Some countess or duchess would hear of it, and what would she say, the darling? Perhaps she would not notice it, for I imagine countesses don't trouble themselves about boots, especially clerks' boots, for you know there are boots and boots. But they would tell her all about it. Her friends would give me away. Ratazia, for instance, would be the first to give me away. He visits the Countess V. He says that he goes to all her receptions, and he's quite at home there. He says she is a darling, such a literary lady, he says. He's a rogue, that Ratazyev. But enough of that subject. I write all this for fun, my little angel, to amuse you. Goodbye, my darling. I have scribbled you a lot of nonsense, but that is just because I am in a very good humor today. We all dined together today at Ratazyev's. They are rogues, Varenka, dear, and brought out such a cordial... But there, why write to you about that? Only mind you don't imagine anything about me, Varenka. I don't mean anything by it. I will send you the books. I will certainly send them. One of Paul de Kock's novels is being passed round from one to another, but Paul de Kock will not do for you, my precious. No, no, Paul de Kock won't do for you. They say of him, Varinka dear, that he rouses all the Petersburg critics to righteous indignation. I send you a pound of sweetmeats. I bought them on purpose for you. Do you hear, darling? Think of me at every sweetmeat. Only don't nibble up the sugar candy, but only suck it, or you will get toothache. And perhaps you like candied peel? Write and tell me. Well, goodbye, goodbye. Christ be with you, my darling. I remain ever your most faithful friend, Makar Diovushkin. Breaking in. For the record, Paul de Kock's novels were popular in their time, but considered racy in conservative circles. Makar's indignation here is a bit funny, given the passages from Ratazyev that he quotes with approval. It should be clear that Ratazyev is lying about several things, including the cash he can get for his work. You can judge the quality of his stuff on your own. But for a bit of reference, while writing the very book we are reading, Dostoevsky wrote to his brother that he hoped to get 400 rubles for it. 
Ortasiev's tale of 5,000 to 7,000 roubles is a tall one. Our dear, credulous Makar has been thoroughly taken in. End of comments.